Welcome back, everybody, to this session. The session is titled The Role of Modern Technologies in the Sustainable Future of Smart Cities. I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. We have two that are two of them, two of our esteemed panels that are not going to be available today, but we will still mention whom they are. And they are Mr. Saeed Al Falasi and Dr. Sahil Munir are, will not be able to join us today. So, Without further ado, Professor Moritz Van Ruygen, Chief Academic Officer of Global University System. Thank you again for showing up. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Greta Sapkaidi, co-founder and board member of uh, SafeSum. Thank you. And Mr. Matt Moe, he calls himself Chief Visionary Officer. I like that. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> well, we, you know, I'd, like, I'd love you to start since we, we owe it to you. So please, there you go. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Saeed Al Falasi, Executive Director at the Dubai Future Foundation. Uh, I was just hiding in the back. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a better view for the stage, I guess. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for, your, for yourself, for the team, for having us here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for being here. I mean, uh, just I know you were very humble about this, but I will introduce you. He leads the, um, he's the Executive Director of Future Design and Acceleration at the Dubai Future, Accelerate, Dubai Future Foundation. He leads the Dubai Future Accelerators, Area 2071, and Dubai Future Labs. So... Welcome, thank you. Professor, it's a pleasure, Ms. Greta, Mr. Matt, thank you for, here, for, for being here. So let's go ahead and uh, start. This question is to Professor Moritz. You ready? Okay. Sure. How do we accelerate change, increase clean personal transport, put in place reliable mass transit, and crack the last mile when we talk about public transport? Given the previous panel I attended, I would say rockets would be a good start. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, seriously, um, the interesting thing of the smart city in the current generation, in the 21st generation, rather than the 20th and the 19th generation um, technology, is actually the, the question becomes less relevant. And what I mean by that is that cities have been able to grow because of trains and cars and being able to spread out and build new towns etc but that was the constraint now we're going into an, an economy which is very much based on te digital technology mm. actually you start questioning the concept of that compact city which requires a lot of movement from work to uh, mm. to the place to study and place to living etc you start questioning that is that still the future of the city? So yes, people need to move around. And the question is a fair one. I'll come to that in a second. But the main, main question is actually, this is a massively revolutionary change in our society. Mm -hmm. The same revolution we had when trains and cars were introduced and allowed to completely reinvent the concept of urban living and cities. Uh, and that is that we do not need to continuously be together to work or to study or to produce something, etc. Right? So that's really what the digital technology really means. At the same time, of course, we still need to move around. And what we have to bear in mind is that we cannot do it anymore with 20th century technology. And that is you can't expect everybody to continuously drive a car you need too much space for roads, etc. So we need to be much more selective in our movements. And you pointed your finger, the biggest issue with public transport is the last bit. Public transport is, of course, the most sensible thing, how to move around. But yes, we will have to move to things like autonomous car driving, but especially also make it in a more compact way. That technology is already pretty advanced. You can have buses without drivers and some bringing you to the door. Actually, that is no longer science fiction. It's there. 
and many cities are actually really seriously considering adopting it, experimenting with it. I work with a German city called Iserlohn, and we already started recently experimenting a little bit with you know, small buses which actually could take people to the required place rather than to the next bus stop. So that's it. The other thing is, of course, being Dutch, I still think that the bicycle is very effective, uh, but I fully appreciate that a bicycle in Dubai, for instance, would not be the most obvious yeah, I was, choice. I was going to say there are certain, certain vehicles in Dubai that we can't use and we really still heavily depend on cars. And that's why on our streets you'll find more Teslas than uh, Hondas, I don't know, maybe soon. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I appreciate it. So our next question goes to Mr. Saeed Al Falasi, if you don't mind. We actually, I'll be honest, it was supposed to be split between uh, Matt and Greta here, but now that you're here with your gracious presence, so let's go ahead and, and get some of your information. Um, what is the role of blockchain in smart cities, and how do you see it play, especially in the United Arab Emirates? Uh, th thank you for that question. Well, I think at the end of the day, this is a panel discussion, so if anybody has something to say, we should just jump in <laughs> okay. and add value to the most people that are here today. I think it's, a, it's a, just to touch on a little bit also on the question that we had earlier about Lot Smile and how we can support transportation. I think when we look at different cities, we look at different countries, one of the main challenges is the question that we always ask ourselves, what really comes first? Is it innovation or regulation? And we quite often we see that regulation is actually does stop a lot of the innovation being implemented. Um, we had, uh, we had, we work, we tend to work with the government uh, quite closely. And we work with RTA uh, into the last mile and, um, and transportation and allowing people to uh, utilize their services. They came to us and they said, we, we, we use the transport, uh, the public transport in the city quite often, at least the people of Dubai do. But the challenge in the public buses, they are quite expensive, um, create congestions on the road. They're not great for the, uh, for the environment. How can we take the Uber sort of model and try to implement it? So we went into the face of, let's think about it, let's imagine the future. At least this is what His Highness Sheikh Mohammed always tells us. We have to imagine, design, and execute for the future. So if we were to imagine a situation where somebody walks into a public bus stop, use an application to identify where he's standing or where he's trying to go, and a small bus comes across and not only try to optimize the best route for that passenger, but also for the people that are already on the bus. Accordingly, he will use the, the, the least amount of time, uh, use the least road to be able to get the person from point A to point B. Now the question is, would normally our regulations allow for such behavior? So we have the taxi, we have public buses, but now we have something in between. So we have to always look internally and see how we can actually change some of our regulation to enable some of those, uh, some, some of those technologies. And this is something that I just wanted to add a little bit to uh, what, what Doctor was saying. Um, and the other thing is about blockchain. And I remember when we worked with government entities, they come to us and say, we would like to adopt blockchain. We would like to adopt artificial intelligence. And we say, okay, that's great. Uh, we like your excitement. But we want to understand how would you actually utilize those technologies. So it's quite essential for individuals, companies, government entities to understand what are they trying to achieve before even identifying what technology they, they're going to use. But for blockchain, it's, it's quite important for us in Dubai at least. I think uh, the, uh, the Emirate of Dubai have launched multiple initiatives with Smart Dubai and other government entities to be able to utilize blockchain transfer of data and, be, uh, and try to stand out as a smart city. Uh, but again, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to smart cities is that do we implement the infrastructure and the guidelines for Dubai itself? Should we integrate it with other Emirates like Sharjah to allow for smart transportation and make it less traffic? So the data exchange between cities is quite essential as well. And to make sure that we have the right infrastructure, we have the right guidelines around it as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Very well uh, said and detailed. I remember when the term blockchain came up and uh, I was like, what is this? And then, then the other one came, cryptocurrency. He's like, what? So everything makes more sense today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Said. So moving on to our next 
esteemed, beautiful panelists. Uh, Ms. Greta. Thank you. Um, examples of cyber attacks, including state-based, are increasing and as cities become interconnected and smart. The data they hold will become more attractive, obviously. How do cities protect themselves from, you know, sophisticated attacks and what data protections do we have in place? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, basically, uh, when, when we hear the word cybersecurity, cyber attacks, it, for all of us normally it sounds like something distant and something very complex. But it can be as simple as, uh, I think everybody here has a phone. I saw just through the window, there's LT Salat uh, antenna. So if we place another antenna that has the same range, tune up the power, and all of our mobiles will hop on that fake antenna. It's as simple. Uh, a lot of, uh, infra a lot of uh, IT architects, a lot of infrastructure designers uh, forget or oversee the most important thing. They secure the servers, they secure the access points. They forget that the connection have to be secure as well, because uh, even there was, um, there was an example, it was in the uh, United States not so long ago, it was a uh, hacked uh, petrol pipe. Uh, there was one state without the petrol, people were queuing uh, lines, and what they actually hacked, they hacked a connection point. Uh, so it's not an advertising, but there's a safe sim, we solve that problem. <laughs> And this is one of the future technologies that uh, should be considered, or that type of a technology should be considered, not only in the smart cities, but in everybody's uh, consideration to have a safe tunnel of the data. Because there's a safe sending point, safe receiving point, but what's happening in the between, it can be as simple as putting up another antenna and making it strong. So just to uh, bring awareness to this problem of the actual connectivity. Of course, smart cities will have insane amounts of sensitive data, uh, can be used for good or bad or whatever. So for it not to be used and authorized, the connection must be secured with whichever methods, but the connection itself must be super secure. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. I was thinking, it's not an advertisement, it, it's reality. You're gonna, we're gonna need um, support, we're gonna need um, s security, so. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank appreciate you. it. So Mr. Matt, Hi. already. How can we use technology to make the cities of the future more efficient and reduce waste? Yeah, so I can talk about this topic for hours. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a coach also, I like to talk very long. So I'll just try to keep this uh, yeah, very definitely short. Definitely, because uh, <laughs> the, the people over there are queuing us. They had me yeah. sit here so I can see time. So you're, you're uh, okay, go I ahead, understand. please. Yeah. So um, there's two things I, I kind of picked out for today for the shortness of time. So one thing that's really important that we need to, um, like Greta just say, said, raise awareness and, and have this as a thought process is the way we, we do construction today. Um, it's a belief that approximately 7% of the world's carbon emissions come from construction and there is a possibility to reduce that by 70% by going into 3D printing. Now, uh, Dubai and the UAE have actually already been on the forefront of 3D printing. The first uh, th proper 3D printed house is actually in Dubai. It was a Dubai municipality building. And uh, this, is, this is something that's important that we need to um, really start focusing on. Um, First of all, it's very cost effective because you need almost no staff and you have a certain speed in which you can produce housing. So one square meter, it takes about five minutes to build that and the 160 square meter uh, house would take approximately 12 days to build. And it is believed today that approximately 1.6 billion people around the world, so this is not just a UAE topic, but global, uh, 1.6 billion people are believed to uh, be in need of proper housing, and this will increase to approximately 3 billion people by 2030. So it's, that's, that's one important topic that, you know, going forward with all the construction efforts here, uh, that this is a, a topic that becomes more and more important and more aware. People who will be using 3D printing housing, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that this becomes more wow, of... Wow, three of, billion. 
people will be in need wow. of housing by 2030 if we continue the way we have been doing this today. And the other uh, important topic is that, and, and this has been on my mind for a very long time, um, I'm actually a German national, and I just really love the UAE. Um, I, I grew up here. I've been in the UAE since 1990. I went to school here also. You must speak Arabic. Unfortunately, very little, but I can read Too it. Too bad, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, a huge, huge uh, supporter. I also want to thank Adnan for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, always love, love being here and, and having opportunities. So one thing that's been on my mind for a long time since back then and hasn't really changed until today is another important topic for future cities is how we deal with waste and how we avoid waste. Because if you look at, for example, the way we approach today in this country and also in the region, uh, take out containers, single use, uh, food containers, this is something where I want to just provoke a little bit the thought that this needs to be changed. So um, there must be better ways and smarter ways to do that by using, using reusable containers. Because if we continue with this, like, you know, if you order takeout food, you have a bag of trash like this. Uh, this yeah. cannot continue. We're going to get into serious trouble with that. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Matt. So, Professor Moritz, um, I myself have a special needs child, and she's uh, 17 years old today. She's not a child anymore, but I see her that way. And uh, the UAE is very adamant about that sector, providing services. How do you see the future of technology helping, supporting special needs in general? First of all, it's a sign of civilization. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It's a sign of civilization when we really understand that people have different needs not just special needs but different needs and that those who need extra extra care really are being taken care of in the community etc and i think this is this is something which really w you highlight something very important here not just for you personally but also the way the, the society here understands uh, how important it is Obviously, I can give a technical answer. Yes, there's a lot of digital technology being developed and so on, which help people uh, have a higher quality of life and, and being supported and so on. But the other thing is, what we want to avoid is, is, is to put people in, in, segregate them from society. On the contrary, the, really the, the purpose you want to have is to bring people disregarding of their needs or their abilities to bring them as much as possible into society and technology is a tool to give people that uh, opportunity and to to support them uh, one project I'm, I'm might interest you which i'm involved in is in the german city of isalom a smart city and part of the smart city development there is actually to create an, an innovation hub whereby we don't just develop knowledge and so on in the conventional sense, but actually we create a community living there which mixes students, elderly, people with special needs, etc., all around the, the, the concept of healthcare, support, well-being, quality of life, and so on. So we mix living and learning and developing together and take care of the individuals, whatever their particular needs might be at that moment, but in the context of knowledge and, and innovation. And with digital support, but mixed with bricks and mortar uh, uh, development. And I think that's something which I really picked up from you, which is, is, is a crucially important word, and that was regulation. When we talk about innovation, the key point about innovation is the fact that you need to create freedom. You need to liberalize. I think there's something which here in Dubai, for instance, has been really beautifully shown with the free zones, where you actually took away regulations allowing for a lot of innovation to start happening in Dubai, not just foreign providers setting up. My, one of my own universities, a German university called University of Europe, we are setting up here in Dubai very soon. We got the, the licenses now in place. We do that because we have opportunities here which are created by freedom and, and, and a lack of regulation almost. Regulations are important to protect people, to protect the environment, but you cannot get real innovation when you over-regulate 
And I think that's really where we have to learn a lot from what's happening here. Creating that freedom, creating the freedom for innovation, but mix that with social responsibility and taking care of all our citizens, whatever their need are, especially when they need extra care. Thank you. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, Mr. Saeed, I have a question for you, and I'd also like to highlight on what your role is in Dubai Future Foundation, how the accelerators and how you as a head and leader of a team, how are you um, investing in this motion of forwardness, this 5G smart cities growth for Dubai? So I think it'll be interesting for the people from around the world that have come here and visit us at the summit to know and highlight what you guys have been doing. Thank you for this opportunity as well. Um, I think as part of the Dubai Future Foundation, we have, we have a program that is called the Dubai Future Accelerator Program. And whenever, whenever anyone hears the term accelerator, they immediately start thinking about startups and entrepreneurs. The reality is, when we try to accelerate within government of Dubai, is that we're trying to accelerate the government department themselves by allowing them to start having uh, or building programs to allow them to be forward thinking as well. So we partnership with the different government entities uh, through this program to allow them to adopt new technologies and to really uh, allow them to work with the best minds from across the world. Today, I think a lot of the government entities, individuals, companies, whenever you try to contract with anybody, uh, you're limited in your contracts with companies that exist only in UAE or only in Dubai. Obviously, for obvious legal reasons, you can only do that. But in reality today, if you limit yourself to the companies that are only exist in Dubai or UAE, you're also limiting the amount of innovation that you can adopt. Being able to have that window and start looking outside and work with the, with, the, with the startups, companies, entrepreneurs from across the world, you're inviting that innovation in and start trying to implement. We have a, a number of programs. We worked with approximately 140 challenges with government departments. From, from, uh, from an example that I provided earlier, which is bus on demand or with RTA, to joint projects between uh, DUA as well as RTA, looking into our typical normal streets that we have in Dubai and how we can provide that road as a surface. Number one, from the vehicle vibration on the road to produce energy, from the lights to uh, eliminate those lights uh, as well from the solar energy. And we work very closely with them to really think differently. Dubai built one of the largest solar panels uh, parks in the world. They came to us and said, look, we, we have an amazing technology, we have amazing space, we've invested quite heavily. But we realized that a lot of the dust actually start building up on those solar panels. And we cannot afford to continue to hire lots of people just to clean it on a daily basis. How, how technology can support us doing that? And we worked with them very closely into bringing actually a startup from South Korea who built a robot just to clean those solar panels on a daily basis, thus increasing the efficiencies of those solar panels. So the Dubai Future Foundation, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, is the right hand of government departments in Dubai, allow them to adopt new innovation and technologies based on their sectors and based on their needs. I think in any economy, uh, the government departments are the biggest buyers, the biggest purchasers. And in order to have the private sector follow, the government does need to uh, invest and, and work very closely uh, with, with the private sector, hence adopting those technologies and bringing those innovation uh, back to Dubai and UAE. Thank you for that. Um, it's uh, quite impressive what you do, and uh, it's a pleasure having you all here. I have one last question. It's going to be a common question for all of you. Um, just to tell you a little bit of what I do, my research, I'm the first PhD scholar to research emotional intelligence and its effect on leadership in the MENA region. And uh, I'm about to discuss very soon, this is the end of the next semester. The idea is how we're able to use emotional intelligence in digital transformation. So my question to you will also help me in my research. I, I will be a little selfish here. So how do you see... Um, the adaptability of people, 
how are they, you, do you believe that, um, especially with the post-corona, what has happened, you know, with the COVID, how quick are we able to adapt? And do we have it in us, emotionally, mentally, health-wise, psychologically, to run through this industrial revolution? As we know that the fourth industrial revolution is the biggest and ever of whatever mankind has ever seen. So how do you see mankind adapting to this rapid change mentally and psychologically? Uh, Matt, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think it's absolutely... Sorry, Greta. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, ladies first, please. I insist. Go first. Thank you. <laughs> so kind. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you very much. Ladies first. <laughs> it's equal well these times, but ladies first. I heard ladies first was another issue, by the way. I don't if, think if so. If you hear the story, you don't want to go first. But anyway, go first now. We'll tell it's you the okay. story later. It's, it's okay. We're brave. Uh, yes, actually, emotional, emotional intelligence. Um, uh, lots, of people, uh, lots of people don't take it as, as a cornerstones of everyday life. Emotional, emotional health, emotional intelligence health. Uh, but uh, especially after post-COVID, especially what was happening in Europe, the two years lockdowns, etc., had a massive, massive effect on everybody. And uh, it wasn't so much felt here in UAE. Really, guys, that was very lucky what, what you did. Uh, and I came across what I wanted to share. This is why I was my insistence. I came across uh, an app that was built to... Uh, manage to improve your emotional intelligence. This app is live, it's on the App Store, uh, after I can connect you with, uh, with the founders because you are in the same domain. And uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. I actually downloaded it yesterday just to see. It's a questionnaire and then they give you courses how to self-improve, etc., etc. And uh, coming, uh, coming from the question why, it gives absolutely another level of operations to whatever you do, whether it's uh, love or work or, uh, I don't know, or innovations or future, you just have completely different amounts of energy for whatever you do because you are coming from the stable ground and then you can shoot like a rocket because when you're coming from the shaky ground, even without realizing that that might have been shaky ground post-COVID, everybody's unsure where they stand, so we're on shaky ground. So we must be sure that we are on a stable ground to achieve any innovation, any goals, any purpose, to give good, good things to the world, to, to serve the world. We must come from the stable ground. This is very, very important. Emotional intelligence, putting yourself together, let's put it in a simple words, that's one of the major things everybody should do and keep a check on. Thank you, Greta, I appreciate oh, it. Matt, please. Yeah, I think to answer your question, we totally have it in us. It's just that very often the environment around us um, kind of steers us away a little bit from, from adaptability. See, like I said, I'm a German national, so the, the German culture, for example, is, is based on, on a blaming culture and a problem-focused culture. So I'm more of a solution-focused person. And I have like this, this theory, so to say, that... Um, What's very important is that you control your thoughts because in the way in which the human mind, body and spirit work is thoughts, feelings, actions and results. So if, if we have a, a positive thought process to understand and embrace that we are able to adapt, then other things can fall into place. So when it comes to emotional intelligence, I think it's extremely important and we definitely have it in us. It's just that it needs to be tickled a little bit maybe from time to time. <laughs> I believe so. You're absolutely right. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Thank you. Professor? Right. We, we heard this morning a powerful speech about attitude and the importance of physical workouts. And one should not forget the importance of the emotional workouts as well. Right? So emotional intelligence is not something you just have or you don't have it. It is something you develop. And it is very important you develop it, just as important, if not even more important, than your physical uh, uh, well-being and health, right? And that is because, you, for instance, things like resilience, knowing how to deal with setbacks and so on. When we talk about innovation, innovation is 99% setbacks and 1% progress, right? We know that. So you need to have that mindset that 
development of that mindset is extremely important. And yes, it's great that there are digital tools to support that more and more, like coaching. I think there's a big future for digital coaching, for instance, life coaching. Uh, we do that already in studying, work study coaching, but uh, with uh, artificial intelligence also we can do more and more in, in life coaching. And I think that development is, is, is crucially important that we really recognize that emotional intelligence is actually what sets us human beings apart in being successful and giving up at the first failure, the first setback, uh, knowing how to interact with other human beings and do that with sincerity. This is where you can teach a machine so-called emotional intelligence, but that is actually faking it, right? And, and I think there was the American newscaster who said, what is important in being successful as, as, a, as a, new anchor, a news anchor is, is sincerity, knowing how to fake it. But I believe ultimately, if you really want to be successful, you cannot fake it actual real human interaction is always based on sincere emotional intelligence and you have to continue working on that and working on that and working on that. Well, thank you so yeah, much, you Professor. See this also, I really if I can appreciate just, it. If I can just add, you Go also ahead. see this in corporations yeah. which have a modern approach that they put more focus on on so-called soft skills yes. versus necessarily having, you know, technical skills and take-off list and this and that. It, this, there's definitely a change coming and that I think plays very much into this emotional intelligence topic for sure. Yeah, that's true. Mr. Said, you're the tech guy, so anything yeah. on emotions? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm the tech guy. But, but reality is that uh, things do change. I still remember asking my, my mother. I asked her, how did the first TV you had at home look like? My question was to get an understanding how the TV looked. Did it have colors? Was it black and white? Or it, does it have a knob on it? That's my, my question was. Her answer was completely different. She said, and I think for most of us, remember that back in the day, women tend to cover when they see men. Uh, and she said, the first time we had TV at home, I started screaming that there's a man in the house. <laughs> and that same woman, not sure if that was a TV or a real person, today is actually checking all her grandkids' feeds on Instagram. <laughs> so about having it in us, we definitely have it in us. And I think as human, the future doesn't happen by its own, right? We do believe when we think about uh, the movies, the Terminators, the, 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 all the bad things that happens in the future, a lot of things will change. But I think the only constant things is us as human. We have to, be, we have to know how to live with, with each other. We need to know how to live with technology. We need to know how we can cooperate and heal ourselves as well. And that's quite important with all these disturbances around us as well. Thank you, Mr. Said. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor Greta, Matt. It was a pleasure. Thank you for everybody here for being. And uh, Professor Mathana, you're back. It's good to see you. Thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's one o'clock, and we're about to round up. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.